<laughs> Let me catch my breath. Uh, thank you so much for coming tonight, and uh, thank you so much for everyone who organized this incredible conference. This is one of the most extraordinary things I've ever been a part of, so I love it so much. Um, I'm going to read from, I'm a playwright, by the way, um, but I'm not going to read one of my plays. Uh, I have written a book, strangely, and I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to read from it, and it's called Lot Six. It's a book that's kind of about how people construct identities for themselves, especially, especially artists, and especially people who feel kind of alienated from the thing that is supposed to be native to them, their families. And, and the, the thing that is foreign to them is the thing that should be native to them. Like, how does that transposition happen? And how do we become selves, whole selves, without it being like pastiches walking around? So anyway, that's what the book's about. I, uh, just to uh, contextualize it, I come from a very small, super duper marginal community of Sephardic Syrian Jews in Brooklyn. There's about 20,000 total. Um, and it's a very hermetically sealed, odd <laughs> community. Um, and it's a different thing from Ashkenazi Jews. The closest analog would be maybe like Kardashians, but like Kardashian adjacent. Uh, but it's in that kind of world. It's a super materialistic community, but also kind of religious at the same time. And those things always abut very uncomfortably. But um, in any case, um, uh, I, you know, I, we, my family didn't have a lot of money. So we, did, we, weren't, we weren't cool and we weren't chic and we weren't in Calabasas. <laughs> we were um, on the fringes of all this. But I'm gonna read from a section of the book when I'm starting high school and I sort of make a decision to try to embrace this thing that I kinda hate, but I wanna fit into it and I wanna be good at it. Um, so I wanna be, it's, <laughs> I call it in the book, Syrianized. That's what people said growing up. So, um, okay, this is from my book. It's, uh, the chapter is called, It's a Sin. My father was one of those men who, once their fathers died, became suddenly very religious. Later in life, I came to see this sort of libidinal transfer wasn't uncommon. But at the time, somewhere around the middle of eighth grade, I didn't know what to make of it. He started hanging out with rabbis and was increasingly modeling himself on them. He started wearing a yarmulke all the time, usually under a beige fedora hat, garnished at the brim with an unfortunate, rigidly flexed and speckled feather. He kept saying things about Hashem. That was his new word. If he ate a piece of bread, he thanked Hashem. When he saw a tree on the sidewalk, he thanked Hashem for its arboreal splendor. His piety struck me as performative and fake, and I didn't even know if I really believed in Hashem. My skepticism, which never really left me since those first stirrings in the second grade, troubled me because I found no support for it at school or anywhere else. I once confessed my ambivalence to Howie, that's my best friend, uh, when, who watched Dallas on Shabbos and ate treif. He even pressured me to eat shrimp cocktail at some business lunch and his mother took us to in the World Trade Center. But he'd already cultivated an amazing ability to move between contradictory points of view with untraceable swiftness. When I made my admission, he looked at me as though I'd shat on his most sacrosanct beliefs. What exactly are you telling me, he said. I can't believe what you're saying. After that, I went into a kind of latency about the matter. I tried to declare a moratorium on skepticism to force belief because it was so much easier. And the truth was, I wanted to believe. I wanted a moral foundation for my life. I wanted to make an investment in something bigger than myself. And I wanted to be good, whatever that meant to other people, since Based on the horrified responses I yielded, I could tell I had no innate understanding of goodness. The moral code I tried to build for myself was impotent and insufficient and only brought me trouble. I started going to shul every Friday with my father. We went to his favorite synagogue on Avenue P. It felt manly, a boy and his father, a chorus of men beseeching God on a Friday night. 
I tried to enforce the piety demanded of me, tried to not only speak the words of prayer and ape all the ritual behaviors, but to feel the supposedly concomitant feelings that went with them. Submitting to religion gave me a feeling of safety. I felt sheltered by imposed boundaries. I felt potentially holy. Maybe there really was some rapture accorded to people who said and did these things. Maybe there was some gnomic element that were I to open myself to the possibility, really open myself, I'd sense, and then my life would change, and I'd be transformed by my devotional acts. I kissed a little black cube with a leather strap. I squeezed my eyes shut and rocked on the balls of my feet. I sang incantatory songs in the melismatic Arabic stylings I learned watching old men as they wailed, practically sobbed with devotion. They loved Hashem so much it seemed like they might combust into flames. Religion suddenly seemed like a gateway to a whole new life, a life of moral rectitude. I wanted to change. I wanted to grow up. I made a radical decision to embrace the status quo in every conceivable formulation. I get married. I buy a house in Deal. That's where all the Syrian people lived in New Jersey. I get a job in an electronics store and work my way up to being a Ray-Ban wearing business magnate with a Jaguar and 10X slicked hair. <laughs> I don't have hair. Somehow those all fell along with my new religious devotion under the loose rubric of morality. I had to become sexy and religious and I had to narrow these attributes into a single delta of concentrated ambition. <laughs> I spent the summer plotting my transformation. My father, newly obliged by my passage to manhood, set aside a budget for my expenditures. He had his own linen business now and was making pretty good money so he could afford to indulge me. My bathroom cabinet was arrayed with all manner of ointments and unguents, creams to dispel acne, gels and mousses for my now bumble and bumble coiffed hair. That's a fancy haircut place. Uh, dossiers were kept about what kind of outfits I needed, how many shirts and sweaters, and what brands and what shoes. I had it all graphed in elaborate flow charts on pieces of unreinforced loose leaf paper I kept stacked pell-mell in my top desk drawer. I would return to it night after night, crossing out shoes and replacing it with pants, crossing out pants and replacing that with shirt. It was obsessive, but I'd become obsessive. I was determined to give an illusion of social competence. My insistence on becoming Syrianized was all I ever talked about, and I cajoled Howie into wanting the same, the same thing. There were other Ashkenazi Jews taken in by the Syrian community. He could become one of them. At my urging, he went on a diet where he ate only salad and froze fruit. He started doing the Jane Fonda tape, and he quickly dropped his excess of eau de poix. His face lengthened and thinned out, but this, to my mind, revealed new deficiencies, particularly with his chin, which I was quick to point out was now too egg-shaped. I suggested, because if I couldn't tell him these things who could, that he get it surgically shaved down. And in an act of tender largesse, I bought him a value pack of Sebenol cleansing pads so he could rid himself of the acne that, like his ovoid chin and too protuberant forehead ridge, was ruining his otherwise good looks and chances of popularity. I had to be brutally honest, for I wanted for him the same gleaming perfection I sought for myself. Together, we took the bus to Lester's, this is the like, hot place in town to buy clothes, uh, twice a week. We were like starving animals, greedily devouring new arrivals from the fall lines, rushing to the dressing room with our heavy armloads of willy wear and ton sur ton. Shopping made us anxious, it was work. The manager, Perry, would breezily reassure us that new shipments would be coming soon, while the saleswoman, the rather butch, corkscrew-permed Hope, popped her gums, sputtering and confused by our endless obsessive shopping. There were limited selections at Lester's, and we both wanted the same outfit, so we get into scabrous fights about who could buy what. Ultimately, neither of us would forego a flattering outfit to give psychic individuation to the other, so we ended up with identical wardrobes. <laughs> but I didn't care. By the time classes began, I had all my outfits coordinated by days of the week. I felt almost a military preparation. On the first day of school, after lunch, a Syrian girl struck up a conversation with me near the candy machines. I can't do this, okay? I'm, I'm gonna try to do a Brooklyn accent, but I can't do it anymore. So, you're an Ajmi, she said. Very interesting. That's not how she did it. Uh, <laughs> Very interesting. She gazed contemplatively at her bangles, playing at the circumference of one until it lined up with the bones in her wrist. What's so interesting about it? It's just interesting. That's a good family, Ajmi. What's so good about it? The Ajmis are a good family. Everyone knows that. 
She, I sound like, um, I'm trying to think, I sound like Joan Cusack in Working Girl. That's not what she sounded like. <laughs> this is as much as I can do. Okay. The address are a good family. She unwrapped, she unwrapped a pack of chocolate velaments and popped one in her mouth. I like Ajmi, she said, a contextless smirk plastered on her face. Very sharp. She loudly clicked the mint around in her mouth. The girl was very appealing. She had that marble mouth drone so prized among Syrians. Nasal and cloying, but to me it was heaven. She was squat, somewhat chinless, but striking. She wore a white leather cowboy jacket with matching white cowboy boots and an acid denim skirt that came down to her calves. Her frizzed hair was blown out into the requisite pin-straight helmet, fringed with long bangs that covered her wide, probably acne-scarred forehead, and her lipstick had a bleachy, pearlescent whiteness to it. It seemed like a kind of sunscreen. We sat at one of the carpeted banquettes in the lounge and chatted some more. I learned her name was Yvette Sutton and that she lived on East 3rd Street, a, a stone's throw from the Avenue P Synagogue and just around the corner from a kosher deli my brothers liked. So, who you're related to, she continued. You know Donna Ajmi? She's my second cousin. <gasps> I love her. Who else? I want info. The lines in her forehead compressed as she mentally mapped out my entire family lineage. The Syrian community was insular, but there was something comforting about everyone knowing everyone else. Situating a person inside a matrix of blood relations was like finding a word in a search word puzzle. I rattled off my list of blood relatives to her ecstatic cries of recognition. Then out of nowhere, she took a sharp, sudden inhale, like the whole building had erupted in conflagration. <gasps> Your sweater is stunning. The sweater was an oversized fluorescent orange tonsertan featuring a pixelated faceless worker in overalls climbing a ladder to nowhere. <laughs> I got the last one on a spur of the moment shopping trip. I bought it at Lester's, I said, trying not to communicate my overwhelming sartorial pride. I love Lester's, cried Yvette. I could feel her admiration for me building in quantum leaps and bounds. She became more voluble, telling me about her summer in Deal. That's where all the Syrians have the mansions. Uh, and some ride she and her cousin went on, a great adventure that broke and left her gushing blood. And how her cousin got blue food coloring all over the cat. <laughs> I admired her sudden prefaceless glides between topics, how her every remark was topped off with the omnipresent smirk, which I took as an index of flirtation. Was my makeover working? Was this love? Would Yvette share with me the marble-floored mansion and deal I'd one day own? Would she have Kusab Jibin and Kibbe waiting when I got home from a long day at the electronics store in Midtown? <laughs> As she continued her rambling monologue, I studied her strangled cadences. I practiced making my own speech more nasal so I could sound like her. I tried pronouncing words like my jaw had been dislocated. I blew out my vowels so I sounded practically inhuman, but the inhumanity felt grandiose, almost galactic. When the bell rang, we left for our separate classes. I felt I'd matured in some unspecific yet profound way. It felt like a giant leap, almost too giant, like I'd taken a huge gulp of oxygen. After school, Howie and I met up at the Kocher Pizza Place under the elevated Q train. Sound, he said, picking his teeth with an imaginary toothpick in spontaneous imitation of my mother. Are you gonna ask if that on, if, are you gonna ask if that out on a date, Dave? <laughs> what if she doesn't like me? You said she did. I said maybe she liked me. I'm not positive of anything. Howie told me he'd heard that Yvette, in, in seventh and part of eighth grade, dated and endured a violently emotional breakup with Harry Beta, a popular Paige Boyle hairstyled Syrian boy who was also a terrible bully and one of my main tormentors in grade school. Now the, the stakes felt impossibly high. Event, Event wasn't some shoddy garden variety Syrian girl. She dated high ranking boys in the community. <laughs> and my status could be raised by affiliation. 
That week, I arranged vis-a-vis -vis Yvette's cousin Shelly in a series of twisty back and forth conversations, many of which involved Shelly and Yvette's best friend, Sharona Goldkrantz, who wore the same bleachy looking lipstick as Yvette and had the same boots and the same white cowboy jacket, for Yvette to be in the lounge that Thursday after lunch so I could ask her out. I was terrified, despite the cousin's repeated insistence that Yvette liked me and wanted me to ask her out, that she would reject me, that even though the Ajmes were a good family, ours was a bad branch, and she'd find out or she would hear about my hideous reputation from grade school that I was a weirdo and a loser. <laughs> my mind raced with catastrophic outcomes as I waited in the lounge for her on one of several carpeted rotundas. I was dizzy and sweating. My heart beat violently. I could feel my recently reapplied Clearasil liquefying over my face into a filmy, medicinal sheen. Eventually, Yvette appeared at the entrance of the lounge. She walked toward me with her mischievous, cockeyed smile, the fringe of her cowboy jacket flapping with each step. When she arrived at my rotunda, she stood looking down at me, the low angle of perspectives accenting her, chis her chinless physiognomy. She seemed to want me to stand, but I nervously made an impulsive, unshakable decision to continue sitting, thinking it would make me seem assured. How are you? <laughs> Good, I replied. What's new? Mrs. Fleischman gave me a demerit, she said, still standing. The height discrepancy was starting to get awkward. How come, I asked. Because she's a disgusting washi, she exclaims quite suddenly. That's a bad Syrian word. I hate playing kickball. Oh, me too, I hate gym. I said, bristling inward inwardly at my own ineptitude for small talk. With my last comment, I had inadvertently segued our less than thrilling conversation into a hideous, awful silence. <laughs> Yvette shook her bangles around, then pulled her frayed hair back into a ponytail. So, she said pointedly, you wanted to ask me something? <laughs> <laughs> With considerable effort, because I still believed I'd be ridiculed, I stammered something in my clammy sweat about going to a movie. She scrawled her number on a slip of paper in purple ink. Call me, she said, and loose leaf binder in tow, exited the lounge. My heart rocketed through my chest. So profound was my joy at having been found desirable by anyone, much less a girl who represented a totemic form of Syrian femininity. For our first date, we saw Against All Odds at the Kingsway, and afterwards went for salads at the Greek diner on East 7th Street, where, over the theme song from Against All Odds, which she played on repeat at the tiny jukebox in our booth to keep the pathos from the movie alive, <laughs> Yvette rhapsodized about the movie, how romantic and tragic it was, how stunning Rachel Ward looked, how mysterious the character was, and how she loved when people in movies had mystery, like the Amish people in Witness. I was hardly listening to her. I was fixated instead on exaggerating my vowel sounds, thinking about my cologne, my hair, wondering if I used enough styling mousse. My self-involvement meant as a safeguard a way to ensure my presentability had the contrasting effect of making me more null and blank. I wanted her to believe in my worth, the worth that attracted her the previous year to Harry Beta, but since I had none, I had to produce an illusion of worth in inferences like the mystery she inferred from Rachel Ward's character in Against All Odds. I was removing my personality feature by feature until I developed an eerie but genial emptiness, like a house stripped of furniture. At the end of the night, I walked her home and we stood together in awkward silence on her front step. I knew I was supposed to initiate a kiss or hug, but I had no impulse to do it. And anyway, kissing seemed improvident and somehow blasphemous. We were subjected to a lot of mixed messages at the yeshiva. We were meant to prepare ourselves for marriage, but sex was also dirty, and girls couldn't wear skirts that showed any knee. And human contact, even platonic pats on the shoulder, made people squeamish. The line between religious etiquette and natural sexual curiosity felt unclear. Maybe kissing was like being on drugs, or eating shellfish, or an unkosher Snickers bar, and it made you revolting and subhuman. I'd heard rumors that some girls were sluts, Corky Lanyato, for instance, but what did that really mean? Did they have actual sex with people? Florence Goldbaum supposedly gave Ralph Haddad a hand job at the UA Sheepshead Bay Cinema during a screening of Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome. But when the rumor came back to her, Florence screamed, it's not true, it's not true, and covered her eyes and burst in hysterical sobs right in the middle of the lounge. After that day, she seemed tainted to me. 
I'd sneak glimpses of Florence in class as we studied Rashi or Zionism and imagined some sexually transmitted infection lurking subcutaneously. Sex seemed ugly, almost criminal. It was so humiliating for girls to be subjected to it. At the same time, I was envious of Florence because I myself wanted to give Ralph Haddad a handjob or something in the family of handjobs, I wasn't sure what. After hearing the story about Florence, I fantasized about Ralph during class and hated myself for my fantasies. I had been trying to ignite libidinous feelings for girls since I was nine, when I found that ripped up copy of Club Magazine under Stevie's mattress, that's my brother. But the giant breasts couldn't get me going the way Lee Majors did with his tracksuit. Of course, I would never do anything about my attraction to boys. It wasn't even a remote possibility. And even if I had the chance, which I never would, I could, quote, get AIDS and die, a refrain heard frequently in those days. If homosexuals died of AIDS, I didn't want to know about it, just as I didn't want to hear the sodomy jokes Mrs. Wasserstein made in law class when discussing Bauer versus Hardwick, though I laughed with the rest of the class when she told them. And if there were homoerotic undercurrents to my friendship with Howie, those were safely bedded in a dark continent of denial, a denial we fortified for each other because it was a form of survival. When we rented porn tapes from Avenue J Video, we feigned boredom at all the huge dicks. And in seventh grade, Howie blindly shoplifted a copy of a porn magazine from the 24-hour store, which turned out to be a copy of All Gay Honcho. When Ari Bain caught him with the honcho in his locker, he gave Howie the nickname Honcho Villa. But that nickname only lasted for a week, and then people forgot about the honcho, and so did I. It didn't mean anything, because homosexual people weren't real. Or if they were, they existed as part of some other untoward pervert reality that would never intersect with my own. I was the boy in the plastic bubble. If anything pierced the bubble, pierced the germless world I inhabited, I might die. And though I didn't like life particularly, I still wanted to survive it. I wanted to be good and moral. I kept asking Yvette out on dates, even though I had no idea how to be on a date or whether dates were even supposed to be any fun. I saw them as a sort of prestigious job I got by accident. <laughs> I started to see that the concept of a girlfriend was far more appealing than its concrete realization. Having a girlfriend felt moral, like prayer and religion, like swabbing the dirt off your face with cleansing pads, but that was it. After a few weeks, the novelty of Yvette's boots and pin straight hair wore off. Even that nasal voice whose cadences I held so dear started to grate. Maybe I was too fixated on protocol to get to know her beyond her love of Phil Collins and Wham and her loosely defined aspirations to be a fashion model or designer she hadn't yet decided. But our dates were boring. Yvette subconsciously picked up my weird gambit of making myself blank. After a while, neither of us wanted to make a gaffe or stain anything with too much personality. What if we said something abnormal or strange? When we slow danced at her birthday party to careless whisper at the strenuous urging of Sharona Goldkrantz, we bobbed rhythm rhythmlessly like two wobbling helium balloons whose strings were tangled. I looked up and saw Sharona staring at us from the sidelines with her oversized sweater and huge lips slathered in bleachy makeup, sipping her diet Sprite. Her eyes gleamed with invidious desire. When would she experience a love like that? Thank you. Yes. And now, Luis Alberto Urea. Buenas tardes, Siwani, Tijuana in the house. <laughs> Colonia Independencia presente. So um, first I want to thank the wonderful staff. You've been so kind to us, taking good care of us, um, especially our homegirl, Brianna, um, my teaching partner, Vanita, 
the students I've worked with and all our writer pals. I have a tradition apparently of doing odd readings in front of Jaquita. So this is, I wanted to do something kind of special. Um, so I'm going to read to you from my next novel that isn't published yet. This is the first time I've read it anywhere. You clap now, but you may be sorry. But <laughs> so I want to I want to set this a little bit for you. Um, my mom was white. Can you tell? <laughs> she was a war veteran of World War II, and so I, I just want to tell you a little bit about the milieu we're going to explore together. Um, in the war. The Red Cross and General Eisenhower decided it would be a really good idea to put teams of young women in two and a half ton trucks and send them into combat with a kitchen on the back of the truck to make donuts and coffee for GIs. They were known as the Clubmobile Corps. They were known in the vernacular as donut dollies. And they've been completely forgotten. There's nothing about them, almost anywhere. Um, my mother was one of them. She, like the character in this novel, fled an abusive marriage in New York City and decided to go for broke and do this wild adventure and went thinking, well, this, you know, how bad can it be? This will be fun. Um, sh each truck had a crew of three women. Each truck had this kitchen and each truck had a record player with a bunch of records and a loudspeaker so they would pull into this spot where the soldiers were, put on records, start cooking donuts, making coffee, and they were trained to be sister, neighbor, cousin, mom, platonic girlfriend to keep these soldiers in good spirits. So she got to England, um, with her friends, uh, and they were sent to a bomber base uh, called Glatton in Cambridgeshire. And uh, while they were there, they would go into London and do service at an officer's club in a hotel, which is where we meet this woman in this book at this point. Um, and then after D-Day, they were shipped in their truck to Omaha Beach and they began this journey that was utterly mind-boggling, um, in which they followed Patton all through Europe. They liberated Buchenwald. They were trapped in the Siege of Bastogne. They were trapped uh, in the Battle of the Bulge and were given medals for being the most forward three women in combat in World War II. And then they liberated Buchenwald with the soldiers. So, you know, I, I want to say that Perhaps the worst sin we all commit is taking our mothers for granted, not understanding the unbelievable lives they, they led. Um, I was ordered never to look in her trunk. She had a war trunk. And of course, first chance I did, I, I could get. I went in at seven years old and got all of her Buchenwald pictures out and thought, what, what is this? Um, she had PTSD. She cried and screamed all night, almost every night, which may be how I became a writer. <laughs> really, I'd sit up with Leonard Cohen records all night. Um, so my beloved wife, Cindy, and I have spent a few years tracing their paths. We've traveled their whole journey, and uh, I worked on this book. And I just want to tell you, they're all gone. Every one of them is gone. Um, and the last little thing I just want to throw out to you is that my mother's dearest friend and partner in the truck, the actual truck driver, we thought was dead also. And Cindy, who's a reporter, found her living about 90 minutes from our house in Illinois. She was 94 years old. And we got, you know, we talked to her on the phone. She, she called me Lewis. Lewis! And she said, Lewis, come see me, but don't try to wait till I turn 95 if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> and so we did.
and uh, she made it to 102. And uh, she was something else. So she's one of the main characters in this book. And uh, the book is called Irene. Good night, Irene, actually. So, um, and this will explain to you this, why it's called Good Night, Irene. June 13th, 1944. Irene was stationed at Glatton Air Force Base, but it was her turn to go down to London. Since the Blitz, the Grosvenor Hotel in London had girded itself with a few thousand sandbags, not only because it was beautiful, but because it was the American Officers Club. They had a huge dining room in their ballroom, and the donut dollies sh took shifts serving. She loved all the soldiers, though she had mixed feelings because it was in the officers club that she met the extremely irritating fighter pilot that they all called the handyman. She was serving one day and the door opened and in came this Gary Cooper looking character in a leather jacket and this leather cap with the sides crushed down toward his ears, looking like a thug from 42nd Street. But when he walked in, everybody started calling to him and he knew everyone. She watched him thinking, oh no, this is bad news. And he came to the end where the serving tables were and he looked at all the food and walked past it all and he stopped at her dessert station and he was studying the banana cream pies the coconut cake. And then he went and poured himself a cup of black coffee. And he looked up at her and he said, I gotta watch my weight. If I eat too much, I don't fit in the cockpit. And she said, why do you do that? And he said, do what, ma'am? He said, why do you crush your hat like that? Uh, headphones. He said, it's real lonesome up there and sometimes I like to hear a voice. Went and sat down. She thought, oh, no. <laughs> what she should have understood is that a pilot could easily reach the airbase, and she had to put up with his appearances quite often as he talked to her, flirted with her, tried to make certain delicate advances toward her. And one evening at the pub near the base, he mounted a bicycle to ride off to the Quonset huts, looking like a schoolboy, but he looked back at her and he said, I'll help you out in this war. And she said, I don't need a hero. And he said, yeah, but maybe I do, and rattled away. Today, she was enjoying herself. She had time off from service. Bathing was a little problem in the war, so she had filled the tub with hot water, French bubble bath. She had a chilled glass of Chardonnay on the rim of the bathtub, and she just luxuriated. Above her feet on the wall was an octagonal window where she could look up to the British sky. Suddenly a flock of seemingly terrified pigeons rushed across the window. And she was looking up to see what, what is that when she heard the strangest sound she'd ever heard in her life, this choking, throbbing, coughing, burping sound. And then the creature appeared above the window. It wasn't moving fast. It looked like a huge gray shark with stubby fins. And then attached to its back, a fat, bazooka looking device belching sparks and puffs of smoke and then gouts of fire. She rose up in the bathtub and watched it and then climbed up on the edge of the tub till she could see out the window and she saw a swastika on it and it flew a few blocks from her and the engine died with one puff of smoke and then it glided and descended she watched it fall, it wasn't fast. It was as though you'd thrown a rock off a cliff at the beach. It dropped 
vanished behind a row of buildings and exploded. The explosion knocked her back into the tub. She splashed water, spilled her glass of wine. She flailed immediately. Sirens began sounding all over London. Klaxons sounding. The woman downstairs was screaming. She didn't know what to do. What am I to do? I'm a donut dolly. How am I supposed to help? But she couldn't stop herself. She ran into the bedroom and looked around and she grabbed her Red Cross trousers and pulled them on over her wet legs and her white blouse and she put it on and she couldn't find shoes so on her bare wet feet she pulled on her boots without socks. People were now pounding on the door. Evacuate! 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 She opened. People were running everywhere. There were already British soldiers guarding the elevator. No lift, no lift, down the stairs, down the stairs now, no lift. She went down the stairs almost blind, not knowing what to do. People bumping into her, knocking her out of the way. She ran out onto the street, completely confused now. The th she heard herself say out loud, I am completely alone. People were running into the underground already, used to the blitz. Vehicles were going, firemen were going, police cars with the klaxons sounding. Soldiers were running into her. She didn't know what to do, saw the smoke and just began to walk in that direction. At that moment, a lorry full of British soldiers pulled up and they yelled, yank, yank, come on, come on, get up. And they pulled her up and they fled. They ran straight for the fires, for the smoke. When they got there, she stumbled off and she just joined the soldiers and ran into the black wall of oily stench. She couldn't see very well. She was looking to, what can I, what can I do? Where can I help? She looked at the ground and it was covered in ice-like shards of shattered glass. And between the cobbles was a terrible tracing of red everywhere she looked. And then the smoke cleared a little and there was an overturned carriage and lying in front of it on its side with its legs stretched as though running a dead horse and beyond it a pile of laundry that she knew was the driver. She started calling out, hello? Is anybody here? Can I, can I help anyone? And she heard American voices. Lady, lady, we're over here on the curb, on the curb, head this way. She went through the smoke. It was clearing a little bit. She could see flames, pieces of brick still falling. And there were two GIs torn up, covered in blood. One slumped over, the other looking at her with his hand out. She went to him. She did not know what to do. She said, what do you need? What do you need? And he said, we need help. We need help. Then he looked at his companion and he said, I, I think Eddie's gone. She knelt, took the tail of her shirt and started blotting blood off his face. And he grabbed her wrist and he said, lady, Lady, find the girl. She said, what girl? The girl, the flower girl. It's the prettiest girl I ever saw. I was going to buy some flowers. She was carrying flowers. She walked right into it. Please, find her. I, I will, she said, I, I will. She backed away and she said, help is coming, help is coming. Just stay there. And she stepped back into the smoke. She didn't know what to do. She felt silly. Well, how, how, how do I find this girl? And she started calling out, girl, girl, flower girl, are you here, girl? As she went down this burning, rubble-strewn street, and she thought, in all the cacophony around her, the voices, the yelling, the British accents, the American accents, she thought she heard a voice behind her calling, Irene. And she turned, and there was nothing back there. And she, 
she moved forward. And suddenly, a cat came out of the smoke. It was burned. And she watched it walk by. And when she looked up, the flower girl came toward her. Her clothing was torn, burned. There was smoke coming from her back and from her hair. But the flowers were untouched. She looked like she was weeping blood. And she walked toward Irene and swayed and fell at her feet. I, Irene didn't know what to do. She knelt with her, put her hands on her, said, flower girl, flower girl, flower girl, flower girl. And she heard her name again. Irene, Irene, Miss Irene. And she turned around, and it was the handyman running toward her. And he grabbed her. He said, Irene, Irene. And she said, what are you doing here? And he said, I knew you were going to be down here. I knew you would come. And she said, she's sick. He had seen this many times already. He, said, he knelt beside her. He put his hands on the flower girl's back. And he said, she's going to be all right. We're going to let her sleep. They'll come get her. They're right behind me. Come, let me help you, Miss Irene. And he helped her stand up. And he said, I'm going to. You've done a lot. I'm going to get you out of here. Trust me. I do this often. L l walk with me. And he started leading her out of the smoke, away from the horror. He led her all the way back to the hotel. When they walked in the lobby, the panic was over. The lifts were actually running again. He was holding her up. She was unable to even speak. They walked in and the staff stopped and just stared as handyman took Irene to the elevator and he opened the sliding door and got her inside and slammed it shut and he said, what floor are you on? She said, uh, I think I'm on the fifth floor okay he punched the button took her up to the fifth floor opened the accordion door and said what direction what side what room she said it's that way so he led her that way until she pointed to a door they opened it he helped her inside he wasn't sure what he was supposed to do so he sat her on the bed and he looked around the beautiful bedroom. She was already making the bedspread filthy. He said, I've got an idea. Just sit here. Hang on. He went in the bathroom. And he found the bubble bath. And he found some candles. And he thought, OK, I got this. He lit three candles, turned on the faucets, put in some bubble bath came out to her, knelt down and took off her boots. Her bare feet were already blistered and bleeding. He said, Miss Irene, I'm running the bath for you. Do you need help getting ready to take a bath? And she said, no, I do not. He said, OK. And he helped her in. He said, I'm going to close the door, but I'm going to leave it open just to crack. Thank you, Miss Ma'am. She took off her uniform, dropped it on the floor, and got back in the bathtub, settled down into the water, and closed her eyes. He didn't know what to do. He stood there, not looking into the bathroom, and he said, uh, Miss Irene, you need somebody to scrub your back? She said, absolutely not. Okay, okay. No, I get it. Okay. He said, look, don't do nothing. Just soak. I'm going to go to my room and get something for you, okay? All right? Yes. 
Okay, I'll be right back. Don't, don't do anything. He went down the hall. She lay back in the water thinking, I've made a terrible mistake. I thought it was all going to be fun with my girls in our truck. Donuts, what is this? I'm not ready for this. I, I need to go home. I need to stop now. I cannot do this. She heard him re-enter her room, shut the door. She was listening. She couldn't understand what was going on out in her room. But then she heard him sitting down, settling down outside the door of the bathtub. And she lay in the water listening what shenanigans he might be pulling on her when she heard a guitar start to strum. And then in his tenor, he began to sing. It was almost a whisper. And when she realized what he was singing, she began to weep in the water. And she was trying to imagine, what do I say to this cowboy singing me this song now? But she didn't have to worry because when he was done, he started again. And he was singing, Irene, good night. Irene, good night. Good night, Irene. Irene, I'll see.